Good morning. Good morning. Oops. Sorry. Got my mask. Ew. Okay. Um, let's see. It's we're reading Acts 9, 36 through 43. I'm not used to seeing myself on a screen. This is really weird. Okay, now, in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with a request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Don't ever 
feel discouraged for Jesus is your friend and if you lack for knowledge he'll never refuse to learn there is a John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. It was the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness to me. But you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'm so happy to be in a community of grace. <laughs> the gospel lesson I just read feels a bit familiar. Actually, I preached a sermon here in January on a different but similar passage from Luke chapter 4. Here's a quick refresher. Jesus is rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth because he declared the prophecy of the year of the Lord's favor, the Jubilee, where all debts are forgiven, all those in slavery or indentured servitude, the poor, the oppressed, the war-torn, the sick, the dying, those who would be named as either sinners or saints, all free. Scandalous grace and mercy abounding even for those, no, especially for those who would be labeled as undeserving. Jesus declared in the temple that all this was coming true in their hearing. I invited all of you back in January to consider that this radical love was too much for his hometown to accept. So they tried to drive him off a cliff. We're also told in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus simply passes through their midst and went on his way. He went on his way to spread his message of grace and love somewhere else. And in today's Gospel reading from John 10, we hear a slightly different scenario. Jesus is not in Nazareth. He's in Jerusalem and is interrogated. How long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Messiah or not? And he answers them very clearly. I've told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. It goes on to say the Father and I are one. And again, outrage. The crowd takes up stones. They're ready to stone him to death. If we read a little bit further in the chapter, we hear the crowd decides to put hands on him to arrest him, and he simply escapes from their hands. It wasn't the time yet. And the narratives in Luke 4 and John 10 both give us a model for discipleship 
a model of what would Jesus do. For if we are truly disciples, followers of the way, as early Christians called themselves, some would get outraged. Jesus preaches and teaches a love that's so shocking, so radical, so scandalous, that the crowds go after him. That's a pretty intense example, yet the early Christians took this model very seriously. For those of you at home who don't have bulletins, this sermon is titled, In This Very Room. And I'm focusing today upon the women of the early church. It's Mother's Day, after all. And we will occasionally hear about the early church fathers, Clement, Ignatius, Gregory, Jerome, Augustine, Athanasius. Yes, yes, yes. Important contributors to church doctrine and creeds and to church tradition and history. I'm a big Athanasius fan myself. <laughs> Yet, I want to go back a little further into the early, early church. I want to go back to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, or Acts of the Apostles, is really a companion to the Gospel of Luke, written by the same person. It isn't so much limited to the Acts of the Apostles, as we might think of the 12 that were originally appointed it's more the narrative of the first missions of Peter and Paul and the many disciples or students and the many apostles, those who are sent, that spread the good news as Jesus had commissioned them to do, starting in Jerusalem and going on to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts ends with Paul preaching in Rome with quite a few cities between Jerusalem and Rome in this very room. The upper room is where it begins all in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, when suddenly everyone gathered, including the women mentioned in chapter 1, are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they hit the streets preaching the gospel. Thousands are converted, and yes, certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, were part of this also. Peter preaches a sermon on that day, declaring what the prophet Joel had spoken was coming true. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And once in a while, someone will approach me, either in person or on Facebook, to challenge me with a pesky little piece of scripture just to test me. The particular scripture I'm thinking of is 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. <laughs> right. There are a lot of very well-written commentaries from biblical scholars that are far better than I am. I could point out that there's translation issues or that 1 Timothy is one of the many disputed letters of Paul, as in, we don't think he even wrote it. Women keeping silent is quite opposite, I would argue, to the other instructions from Paul and opposite of just about everything in the Gospels and certainly does not fit with the book of Acts. But over time, I've settled on a very short response. Well, if women had kept silent the day they discovered the empty tomb, where would our church be right now? And people will argue, and that's fine. If we read enough, we learn that women were absolutely critical in the early church. In today's scriptures, we hear about another woman named Tabitha, or Dorcas in Greek, the author of Acts, also the author of Luke describes Tabitha as a disciple devoted to good works and acts of charity and setting for this narrative is in a room upstairs. I don't want us to miss that we're in another upper room. 
Tabitha is so beloved that her followers are very distraught. They find Peter. We find that the primary witnesses to Tabitha's healing, being raised from the dead, were the saints and widows. And this is more than a description of women who have outlived their husbands. Widows in the early church were an order. They were a religious order that took care of others in need. And they often included women who chose never to marry. That's a scandal all in its own in their time. Tabitha was a beloved disciple, likely one of the leaders of this orders of widows and saints, an apostle, I dare say, and very, very important in the early church. And at York Baptist this week, we began that study on today's worship connected with ancient worship. And we had a lively conversation about early church practices and the idea that there were likely women disciples and apostles that led house churches in the early days. We talked about how the author of the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts names women and spotlights them. These are biblical women that did not need to be defined by the children they gave birth to. Think of the prophet Anna in the temple at the presentation of young Jesus in Luke chapter 2. We're told there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, then as a widow until the age of 84. She never left the temple but worshiped there fasting and prayer all night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is before Jesus is even an adult. Women are proclaiming him. These women that were widowed or never married, some childless, some gifted with prophecy, compassionate discipleship, the ability to spread the good news. So what does this mean for us today? I invite us all to realize that there were women in the early church, women of many upper rooms, including and beyond Mary, the mother of Jesus, who were absolutely vital to Jesus' message of love getting spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. These women did not fit any one stereotype. They broke the mold. So for me, those women who would be examples of Christ's love in the world today are mothers, yes, and also those who were never married or divorced, widows or childless, change makers, leaders, women of the LGBTQ plus family, the queer, the lesbian, trans, gender expansive, ace, etc. I invite us to look beyond all gender stereotypes when we think of the word apostle. One who is sent and could be he, she, or they. Today I invite us to explore the stories of Tabitha and the women of all imaginable backgrounds. The way I see it, if we bring harm to any group because of their gender in this society, we bring harm to the gospel legacy itself. Let us not forget the value of all genders, regardless of who we might judge them to be or not to be in this very room. And in many rooms around the world, in the upper rooms of the early church, in our Zoom room, and in our building sanctuary, there is enough love in this room for all of us. I invite us to recognize and honor all who speak and proclaim the good news. It's the news that God loved us so much. He loved each and every one of us so much that God would not be separated from us and sent Jesus to connect us inextricably to the divine love, that divine image within each of us. We're still in Eastertide, 
So let us proclaim the good news of God's love in the risen Christ. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.